Welcome to the Holocaust Memorial Intolerance Center's Curator's Corner. My name is Thorin Tritter. I'm the Museum and Programming Director at the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center, which is located in Glen Cove, New York. This online program, as many of you may know, is part of a weekly series of programs that we launched when our building was closed. Our building is now open seven days a week. We ask you to call up and make a reservation if you can, although we do accept walk-ins. But I continue to offer these programs as a way to share some information about a particular object or image in our collection. Before I start, of course, if you have questions during my presentation, please use the Q&A function of Zoom to type in your question and I'll make sure to get to it at the end of the program. Okay, so today I would like to focus on a letter that was written 76 years ago today on April 28, 1945. The letter was written by a US soldier named Jim Van Ralt, who wrote home to his parents shortly after having visited the recently liberated camp of Buchenwald. Uh, here's a picture of the pages from the letter that we display and a photograph of Jim Van Ralt that we display in our gallery. Jim Van Ralt was a radio operator who served with the 3103rd Signal Service Battalion. Here's a slightly cleaner version of the display. The files or the materials here, the letter and the photographs were donated to the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center by Jim Van Ralt before he passed away in 2010. And we're grateful for his donation and to his family who kindly shared additional information about him with me. Before I delve into the letter and talk more about the liberation of Buchenwald, let me say a word about Jim Van Ralt. He enlisted in the US Army in January 13th, 1942, a little over a month after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. He was at that time a few months shy of his 22nd birthday and had been attending Brown University with his twin brother, Tom. Jim's brother urged him to go together to officer candidate school. And in the end, Jim's brother, Tom, did go to OCS and served in North Africa, while Tom decided instead to join the Signal Corps instead of completing OCA, OCS and was initially stationed at Fort Monmouth in New Jersey. And after two years of first learning to be a radio operator and then working to train others, Jim shipped off to England in January of 1944. Jim told his son, Greg, that he had pissed off his commanding officer, and so as a punishment was sent to England. Perhaps that's true, but it was also the case that in late 1943 and early 1944, America began to gear up for the D-Day invasion, gradually moving its forces over to England. Once in England, the 3103rd Signal Battalion was tasked with one of the most elaborate hoaxes of the war, becoming part of the non-existent 1st U.S. Army Group and part of Operation Fortitude. The, um, the operation was known for its fake army, led by the real General George S. Patton, who was part of Operation Fortitude, which sought to deceive the Germans about where the Allies would cross the English Channel to attack the mainland of Europe. The goal was to convince Germany that the first U.S. Army group, uh, which again didn't actually exist, was the main strike force and that it would attack across the channel at Calais. Meanwhile, of course, the real plan was to attack in Normandy. The deception during the months leading up to the D-Day crossing was crucial to the success of the Allied attack on the mainland of Europe. And crucial to that deception was the effort of Jim Van Ralt's 3103rd Battalion. Jim's job was to send encrypted shortwave Morse code messages day and night that the Germans would intercept and believe were part of a massive troop buildup preparing to cross at the narrowest point of the English Channel. The day before D-Day on Monday, the 5th of June, Jim was actually sent out into the English Channel as part of an armada of small boats that were sending out radio signals and appeared to be an invasion fleet, again, headed to Calais. And as we know, the deception worked. The Germans became certain that the attack would come at Calais 
bunching their forces there and leaving Normandy less well defended for the attack that came the following day. Jim would later cross to the mainland fighting in the Battle of the Bulge in the winter of 1944 and crossing into Germany in the spring of 1945. It was at the end of April 1945 that he wrote the letter that we have on display back to his parents in the United States. We show the first two pages of the letter in our gallery, but it's actually a five page single spaced letter that he later enhanced with two photographs. And it's essentially all about the immediate aftermath of the liberation of Buchenwald. And here, let me give you a little background about Buchenwald, which had been established by the Nazis five miles uh, kind of northwest of the city of Weimar in 1937 as one of the early concentration camps. It initially was used mostly to hold political prisoners who were put to work to enforce labor gangs. But after the pogrom known as Kristallnacht in 1938, about 10,000 Jews were sent there as well. And later, both Russian and American POWs were interred at Buchenwald. By February 1945, Buchenwald and its elaborate system of at least 88 subcamps held a total of 112,000 prisoners. Some of the prisoners from Auschwitz and other camps further east had ended their death marches by coming all the way to Buchenwald. As American forces approached in April of 1945, the Nazis evacuated 28,000 prisoners from the main camp but that left many others still there. And the Americans found at least 21,000 who had been left behind and who had managed to overpower the remaining guards before the Allied troops arrived. The Americans also found records showing that between 1937 and 1945, the SS had imprisoned 250,000 people in Buchenwald, murdering some 56,000 through starvation and hard labor. The entrance to Buchenwald still stands as part of a memorial that was created there. The clock at the top of the entrance is permanently set to 3.15 p.m., the time that the U.S. 6th Armored Division of the 3rd Army arrived on April 11, 1945, the anniversary of which we marked earlier this month. Jim Van Ralt's son, Gregory, told me that once he asked his father why he had been at Buchenwald, but he never got a very detailed answer. It may have been because there was a radio broadcasting tower near the camp, and perhaps he was sent there by the signal battalion. But it may also have been because as soon as American troops reached Buchenwald and the various subcamps, word quickly spread about the infamous conditions. Eisenhower famously visited the sump camp at Ordruf on April 12th, eight days after its liberation, and proceeded to encourage German civilians to see the camp, to show them what they had pretended was not happening, and to Amer uh, encourage American GIs to visit the camp to see what they were fighting for. Another member of Jim's company, a guy named U.S. Cleveland, later recalled that they were stationed not far from Buchenwald, near the end of the war, and decided to go check it out. He explained, Allied commanders were letting American forces see firsthand what the Germans had done. We went in and looked around. We couldn't believe our eyes. The place was sickening. It's also possible that Jim arrived with other members of the U.S. Signal Corps to document conditions in the camp. Just four days before Jim wrote his letter, General Omar Bradley, who had joined Eisenhower at the visit to Ordruf on April 12th, wrote the following words urging the U.S. military to record visual evidence to confirm the horrors of Nazi atrocities. It is the de desire of the theater commander of Eisenhower that both still and moving pictures be utilized to the fullest extent practicable as exhibits in reports of investigations of war crimes committed by the Nazis with particular reference to allied prisoners of war, both in and out of camps and to concentration camps for the purposes of recording for civilization, the history of horror written by over five years of German atrocities. Much of the task of taking those still and moving pictures 
fell on the U.S. Signal Corps, of which Jim Van, Jim Van Ralt was a part. A memo from the Supreme Headquartered Allied Expeditionary Force, Schaaf, to the U.S. Signal Corps clarified that the footage they captured in concentration camps would be utilized as evidence for the Judge Advocate General's War Crimes Commission, but could also be shown to U.S. troops and German civilians. The memo also made filming and liberating camps the number one priority for the Signal Corps. So in late April of 1945, cameramen and photographers began filming during the liberation of each camp. The result was both film footage and still photographs, which were reproduced and distributed widely. I'm going to share a couple of these photographs in just a minute. They offer a view of what Jim Van Ralt saw when he arrived at the camp. I want to warn you, however, that the photographs and the description that Jim Van Ralt gives is graphic and disturbing. They do, however, capture the conditions at the, at the camp at the time and ensure that we don't forget the horror that existed. Jim actually wrote at the beginning of his letter that he hoped his parents would see pictures from the camp soon, but he added, I'm afraid that too many people will say that it's too horrible and they just don't want to look. He went on, that's certainly the wrong attitude. People must force themselves to see these pics, these pictures. Jim Van Ralt's letter begins by describing the prisoners. They were ghostly looking. Every bone in their bodies seemed to stick out. Bony hand, bony legs, bony faces, eyes black and deeply sunken, skin sallow and pale. Here was a strange, new, and horrible world. Here is where skeletons actually walked, though the walk was feeble and unsteady. Here, he said, were living corpses, happy at being free, grateful to us, but too weak to show any signs of their happiness. You know, I should say, you can find a clip or several clips from the liberation of Buchenwald. There's one very good one on the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum's Holocaust Encyclopedia, which shows these ghostly looking men. I chose not to show those images or those documentary clips, but I do think Jim Van Ralt's description captures what they looked like. Jim went on to describe how he found a former prisoner to guide him through the camp, and then he talked more about the prisoner's clothing. First, he wrote, I will tell you these how these prisoners were dressed. The Jewish prisoners wore a flimsy flannel gray suit with light blue stripes. The only other bit of clothing they wore were shabby overcoats and jackets, the remains of the clothes they were captured in. The others wore just plain rags. It could hardly be called clothing. He also described some of the punishments and torture that the Nazis inflicted on prisoners, writing, the Krauts also hung people. But death was not so sweet and quick as you'd think it would be. They did not hang these people in the ordinary manner. It was so fixed that when these people were hung, it took from about seven to 10 minutes for them to die. Our guide told us how they were forced to view these hangings, how all they could do was to stand by helplessly and watch their fellow prisoners die a slow, horrible death. Jim also described the crematoria at Buchenwald, four huge furnaces, he wrote, where the bodies were thrown in and burned. This is one of the photographs taken by the U.S. Signal Corps of those crematoria. Jim then said that their guide showed us a site which I shall never forget as long as I live, a site which any hardened GI would blink and squint at and say, good God. It was a tremendous yard, he said, which would cover a good city block in length and width. At one time, the bodies of prisoners waiting to be burned were thrown here like so much garbage in a pile eight or nine feet high, completely covering the whole yard. It was a horrible sight, he said. The famine and hunger that plagued these people was easily seen. <clears throat> the evidence of beatings, and other forms of cruel treatment was also visible. Broken legs, deep wounds to the bone, smashed in heads, he goes on. And then he wrote, upon each and every one of the bodies was a look of intense horror, 
suffering and pain, which bear mute testimony, he wrote, to the criminal acts that were committed by these mad lunatics. Another of the US Signal Corps photograph captures some of the bodies of the murdered prisoners after they'd been placed on a wagon for removal. Jim Van Ralt's letter continues with descriptions of the barracks and the supposed hospital, which he said included no medicine and was so crowded that it couldn't have helped but to be an incubator of disease. But there are also two other pages that are in our gallery that I wanted to touch on. On the first of these, he talks about the food that was given to prisoners. In the morning, they had a cup of coffee. At noon, they had a piece of bread the size of your index finger and a cup of soup. And at night, a cup of soup only. On this diet, it took more than physical strength to live. It took guts and a hope for the future. Jim's guide, he said, had starved so long that even though he was hungry, he was unable to eat anything. Then Jim hinted at the mental toll that the Nazi starvation had left in its wake. His guide, Jim wrote, showed us a little disc that a prisoner had to have in order to get his meals. Sometimes a prisoner would lose his and would try to steal one from another person. He therefore made it a habit, their guide, to grasp his steel disc, which hung around his neck from a chain, continually. He did so even when he took us around that little desk, disc meant a prolongation of life, but only a prolongation for every prisoner was slated to die. Jim also turned to the scale of the murder that was surrounding him. He reported that in the previous month in February, 2000 people had died in the camp. And that even after liberation, despite all the efforts by the allies, 20 to 40 prisoners a day or 20 to 40 former prisoners a day, were still dying in the camp. In response to those deaths, as soon as the camp was liberated, the survivors erected one of the first memorials to the victims, which Jim described. I saw a monument made out of cardboard and boxes and cloth made by prisoners after the Americans overran the place. It was almost 20 feet high. And at the top, were the figures neatly carved in wood 51,000 in memory of the 51,000 people who had died there. Jim took a photograph and later added it to the letter. Here's a blown up version. The letters are meant to be KLB. I think it looks more like HLB, but they stand for Concentration Lager Buchenwald. It turned out that the prisoners' early estimates were not far from the truth. As I mentioned, later research showed some 56,000 people died at Buchenwald. I should also add that the temporary monument was replaced by a more permanent one later on. So Jim's photograph is one of very few of this initial effort to memorialize the victims of the Holocaust. There's one last part of Jim's letter that I wanna share with you. It's how he closed his letter. They are bringing civilians, he said, to view all this mess. People who lived a stone's throw away from all of this. Their reaction, they weep at what they see, claiming that they never knew this kind of thing existed. Then in capital letters, he wrote, trying to convey his own anger, I have seen them cringe and want to be let out. The sight is too horrible for them. Just think of that. Imagine intentional murderers ruthless killers crying at the scene of their own crimes. Here's a photograph taken by the US Signal Corps showing some of the local civilians as they were forced to see what was taking place in the camp after liberation. Jim Van Ralt's letter from 76 years ago today is a powerful firsthand account of, the Buch of Buchenwald shortly after its liberation. And we're lucky to have it in our collection. I hope I've been able to convey some of its importance. There are three last comments about Jim's letter that I wanted to close with. First, one of the things that makes this letter so powerful is Jim's own talent at writing. Not everyone's letters home conveyed what they saw in such moving terms. Jim was a gifted writer and was able to translate what he saw into descriptive prose. Another notable aspect of this letter is what Jim was able to capture 
was, was that Jim was able to capture his own awe at what he saw. And remember, this is a guy who had been in the army for three years by the time he wrote this and had fought in numerous battles, including some of the worst fighting in the war at the Battle of the Bulge. And yet the horror of what he saw at Buchenwald was worse than what he had seen in any battle. I think his awe is something that should give us pause. And my third thought about this letter is that it highlights how little soldiers knew about what the Nazis were doing, even at the very end of the war. Even though newspapers in the United States had information about the mass murder of Jews in 1943, and the US State Department had confirmed the Nazis' genocidal plan in November of 1942, the American public and US troops were largely unaware of what that genocide looked like in practice. They were also largely unaware of the inhumanity in the thousands of camps that the Nazis had established. It was only through the first-hand visits, like the one Jim Van Ralt made in Buchenwald in April of 1945, that soldiers came to understand what had been going on. And it was through letters home, like this one, that Americans came to understand what became known as the Holocaust. I will stop there. I have to admit that it was a difficult, this, is, this letter was a difficult one for me to highlight because it's powerful content. And yet, as Jim wrote in his letter, looking away or glossing over the details is a dangerous practice. It is the details and all their horror that help us to get closer to understanding something that remains today incomprehensible. So thank you for watching, of course. If you have questions, please type them into the Q&A box. Let me also take a moment to remind you of some of our upcoming programs. This coming Friday, April 30th, we're holding our next virtual story time for children aged three to seven. We'll be reading Alexandra Penfold's book, All Are Welcome, a much more uh, appropriate thing than the letter from Jim Van Rolt. Then on Sunday, May 2nd at 6 p.m., we're holding the next program in our Sunday with Survivor series. In this case, Holocaust survivor Sammy Steigman will be sharing his testimony. And then next Wednesday, May 5th, I'll be back for my next Curator's Corner discussing a photograph in our gallery that shows a pro-Nazi rally that was held in 1934 in Madison Square Garden. And then on Monday, May 10th, at 7 p.m., we'll be holding our virtual Upstander Award ceremony, where HMTC honors middle and high school students who've intervened to stop a bullying incident or other act of intolerance. I hope you'll join us to honor these students who've stood up against peer pressure. You can find more about these programs and a full list of our online programming on our website at www.hmtcli.org under the events tab. And I also hope you'll click on the Give Now button and make a donation to support the Holocaust Memorial and Tolerance Center. Okay, let me turn to some of your questions. I think I see that at least one has come in. Um, yeah, so somebody asks about whether this letter has ever been reprinted or was ever printed in American newspapers. You know, actually, I don't believe this letter was ever publicized in any way other than by putting it in our gallery. We've obviously worked to try and get some publicity around it, but certainly in 1945, I don't believe it was, it was ever publicized uh, or ever printed again. Um, I will say, you know, I think there were a lot of letters like this going home from soldiers who visited these camps, and that is how the American public learned about it, but it wasn't mostly in newspaper accounts. These were much more personal, uh, and this is a, a very good example of it. Uh, somebody also asked about what were the responses or reactions by German civilians uh, when th they made their visits to the liberated camp, um, and whether these responses that Jim Van Ralt explained were typical, and I think they were. Uh, generally, I mean, there was a big effort by General Eisenhower to get Germans to come and march through these and face the horrors of what had been happening right next door to them. And, you know, the kind of common reaction was they didn't know, they had no idea this was going on, and to cry and, and claim horror. Um, how much they did know, I'm not sure. They certainly should have known. 
They could have known, they chose not to know is probably part of it. And there was also certainly many who did know. But yeah, I think their response was typical, uh, the, the response that we see in this letter. Okay, well, thanks very much again for tuning in. I look forward to seeing you at some of our other programs. Have a great afternoon. Take care.